Uh, I'm Takairo Hariyama. Uh, today I talk about uh, breaking compiler level obfuscations used by APTT malware. I'm a senior threat researcher with VMware's Carbon Black Threat Analysis Unit. This is today's overview. First, I explain my motivation and approach. One question. What's the purpose of this function? This function just returns the value. So what were other statements for? They are obfuscations used to make reverse engineering harder by changing the code flow so that it is not linear. One obfuscation is called opaque predicates. The other is called control flow flattening. Those obfuscations are seen in APT10 and malware observed in Asian countries. The recent version samples are obfuscated with those obfuscations. The previous example function is very simple, so we can read it manually. But uh, there are more complicated functions in the samples. Like this. Like this. And like this. So manual analysis for those functions is painful and time consuming. We need an automated uh, deobfuscation method. My motivation is to automate NL code deobfuscations. The obfuscations look similar to the ones described in Hexray's blog. But uh, the introduced plug in Hexray's deob didn't work because it was made for another variant of the obfuscations. So I investigated, uh, investigated the causes, then modified the plug to work for NL samples. Now I demonstrate the tool. Uh, this is the last example function. First I show the obfuscated code. The obfuscated code does not clearly flow from beginning to end. Instead, it has a nested loop structure with multiple flattened code blocks. Money analysis is not realistic. By using the tool, after the deobfuscation, the code becomes straightforward. And the nested loop is eliminated. Let's get back to the slides. Before explaining the modifications, I'd like to cover the basics of IDA microcode. IDA microcode is an intermediate representation used by IDA Protein Compiler. It's optimized in nine maturity levels from low to high level. We can see microcode by using microcode explorer. That is an either, either plugin supplied with hexes deob. For example, in low maturity level, 
the plugin makes over 100 instructions, and the code looks like an assembly code. On the other hand, high maturity levels, it makes just eight instructions, and uh, the code is similar to high-level language, and close to the decompilation result. There are four key structures in either microcode. Basic block array, basic block, instruction, instruction, and the instruction structure contains two or three operand structure, left, right, destination. Hex says they have installed the two optimizer callback functions. Opt block T for control flow flattening, opt incident T for opaque predicates, By using the structures, Microcode Explorer display control flow graph and uh, instructions. Each basic block has uh, a block number. It's unique in one maturity table. And uh, instructions can be nested. In this example, the top level instruction is OR, and uh, shift left and uh, Another or are sub instructions. The difference is important in data flow tracking of opaque predicate patterns. I will explain later. Now I explain the modifications. First, opaque predicates. The original implementation replaces an opaque predicate pattern with another expression based on defined patterns. I added two more patterns and the data flow tracking functions. The first pattern is like this. In the example below, the D word value is either even or out, and the value multiplying the D word by D word minus one is always even. So the lowest bit of the naked value becomes one. Finally, or by minus two will always produce value minus one. So the pattern will be replaced with immediate value two. Then it will be eliminated after the compiler optimizations. The second pattern is read only global variable more than or less than immediate value. The D word uh, the global variable is always zero because it's initialized with zero and it has only read accesses. So the pattern matching function replaces the global variable with zero. There can be other variants like this and the immediate value can be different. For example, nine. Sometimes the modified code has to trace back the instruction and the basic block linked lists. Uh, for instance, the value V5 is a register in microcode. So we have to make sure the value comes from this pattern. And there are other variants to be checked, like this and like this. Usually the basic block pointer for tracking link lists is passed from the argument of opt insanity callback function. But uh, if the instruction is not a top level, the basic block pointer will be null. So the modified code traces from the top level Instruction then passes the basic block pointer to sub instructions. The second modification is related to control flow flattening. I'd like to cover some key points of control flow flattening quickly. Normally, a function obfuscated with control flow flattening has a loop structure starting with the yellow colored control flow dispatcher shown after first block. 
the original code is separated into the orange colored first block and the green colored flattened blocks. Our mission for the obfuscation is to resolve the correct next block for each one, then change the destination. Specifically, we have to find an immediate value called block comparison variable. It's assigned to a specific register in first block or flattened blocks, EX in this case, then compared in a loop to decide the next block to be executed. The unflattening code also has to translate block comparison variables into actual block numbers. There are three main modifications for control for flattening. I will explain each modification from the next slide. The first modification is unflattening in multiple maturity levels. The original implementation works in M at lock, lock up to maturity level due to another obfuscation technique. But uh, I had to unflatten the ANL code in later maturity levels because the block comparison variable heavily depends on opaque predicate conditions. In this example, the V3 value is assigned to block comparison variable, and the V3 value depends on opaque predicate conditions. So once the opaque predicates are broken in later maturity levels, the loop becomes much simpler like this. However, unflattening in later maturity levels makes another problem in block number translation. This is the microcode graph generated in M at lock of the maturity level. The block comparison variable is translated into block number nine in this case. But the block will be eliminated in later maturity levels because uh, due to opaque predicate pattern eliminations. In order to handle this issue, the modified code links between block comparison variables and uh, block addresses in M at lock of the maturity level because a uh, block number is changed in every maturity level. After that, it guesses the uh, block numbers in later maturity levels by using the address information. The guessing is uh, not 100% uh, accurate, but uh, it works for most functions. In ANL sample, one function can have multiple control flow dispatchers. That is not considered in the original implementation. So the modified code catches the decompiler callback event, then calls the optoblock t callback function several times. Uh, according to hex rates, this is the last event for optimizations. Usually, a uh, block comparison variable uh, is unique in one function, but uh, a few functions with uh, multiple dispatchers have duplicated uh, variables. So the modified code detects the uh, duplications and uh, applies the most likely variable in the current dispatcher by validating the block number. The third modification is implementation for various jump cases. The original implementation supports two jump cases. Jump case one, go to case for normal block. Case two, conditional jump case for flatten if statement block. If the next block number is resolved, the control flow graph and the destination of uh, jump instruction are updated. For instance, in the jump case two, block comparison variable is searched in each 
basic block, end with JCC and non-JCC, then change the destination while appending the dispatcher predecessor code to non-JCC detail. I added three more jump cases. Case three, go to any predecessor's case. Case four, two and three combination. Handling jump case three is similar to jump case two, but uh, the dispatcher predecessor will be eliminated. In jump case four, appending code occurs twice. Usually we can find block comparison variables in flattened blocks, but uh, uh, in jump case five that I added, uh, block comparison variables are assigned in the first blocks. Uh, in this example, EDI is a assigned to ESY, and ESY is a block comparison variable in this function. But uh, the EDI value is assigned in block number one and two, not in the flattened blocks. So the modified code reconnects first blocks as successors of the flattened block. In this case, block number one will be the successor of block number seven. In this section, I will explain the issues in either 7.2 and the improvements in 7.3. I tested the two NL samples on either 7.2, and the, mod the modified tool could deobfuscate 92% of the obfuscated functions that we encountered in the former sample. The causes of the failures are First, the next block number guessing algorithm failed. This issue has been resolved in this case, but it may be problematic in the future because the guessing is not perfect. The remaining two issues have been resolved in either 7.3. So I explain each improvement from the next slide. About the first improvement, Either 7.2 does not propagate opaque predicate deobfuscation result if the values are alias the stack slots. That means they are indirectly referred stack values. Uh, in this example, the condition is always true and the value V2 is always this value and it's signed. So the code block is never executed but it still remains because the uh, opaque predicate is not broken in 7.2. Uh, on the other hand, in 7.3, the code block is uh, eliminated. The second improvement is handling a conditional jump of a dispatcher predecessor. Actually, all jump cases can be conditional and 2 to 4 jump cases require a uh, basic block duplication. I will explain why in later slides. Either 7.2 does not allow it, but uh, 7.3 provides the option, specifically this flag. The modified code clears the flag, then uses insert block API to make an empty basic block. After that, it copies instructions and other information. The API usage updates some block numbers related to the exit block, so it also adjusts, adjusts destinations of the blocks uh, passing a control to the exit block. In conditional jump case two, end with JCC, uh, sorry, dispatcher predecessor and non-JCC uh, have different block types, so we can't append the, the dispatcher predecessor code to non-JCC detail. Instead, copy the basic block, and about the false case block, the block number should be the conditional block number plus one. So 
the false case block will be copied as well. Conditional jump case 3 can be handled in the same way, but uh, the predecessor can be conditional too. In that case, the dispatcher predecessor should be copied even if the tail is not a conditional jump. The conditional jump case 4 is uh, most complicated, but uh, I've not seen the case in the tested samples. It's a rare case, but uh, if control flow unflattening fails, some code blocks may be lost. In that case, please run the plugin with specific value. Then the plugin deobascates only opaque predicates, so it recovers the lost code blocks. I wrap up my presentation. The compiler level applications, such as opaque predicates and control for flattening, are starting to be observed in the world. The manual analysis is not realistic, so the automated deobfuscation is needed. The modified code of hex raised deob is available publicly. It works for almost every obfuscated function of APT10 annual samples on ID7.3. <coughs> For this research, I, I'd like to appreciate Hextray's uh, patient support and uh, the original two rows uh, road floors. Last but not least, touching members, especially Jared and Brian. They are the references. That's it. Thanks.